The study of biophysics involves applying known physics to the world of biology. We do this because many biological systems are incredibly complicated to understand. However, the process can be vastly simplified by using a physical model, which we can use to predict how these systems change over time. For example, the cell membrane is an incredibly complex structure in which many biological processes happen. However, we can use a couple of models in physics, such as modelling it as an array of springs which obey Hooke's law, or as an electrical circuit which has a potential difference in which we can apply well-known electrical theory. By using this application of physics to biology, many recent and powerful techniques such as MRI scanning, optical tweezering and drug delivery have recently been discovered. In this video, we're only going to scratch the surface of how physics can be used in biology as, quite frankly, it's a huge subject. So we'll start by covering four topics. For each topic, we'll mention one application of how these concepts are important in the real world. So let's start with one of the most important biological molecules, proteins. Proteins are made up of long chains of amino acids, of which there are 20 different types. A typical protein may contain thousands of amino acids, which form a very specific structure. These can be broken down into four tiers. The primary structure, which is just the sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure, which can either be an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet the tertiary structure, which is the actual shape of the protein, and in some cases a quaternary structure, which is how these different chains link together. But what's surprising is that protein folding is governed by thermodynamics. Proteins tend to prefer being in a folded state, as that minimizes the amount of free energy. The free energy is simply the difference between the enthalpy and the product of entropy and temperature and whether it's positive or negative tells us whether a process is likely to happen or if it's forbidden. The term here, entropy, is a measure of the amount of disorder or possible ways for the protein to arrange itself. Hence, a protein fold will decrease the amount of entropy and therefore energy. By understanding the thermodynamics, this allows us to create the conditions to build specific proteins, which is super, super useful. Now we're going to have a look at diffusion. Diffusion is the net movement of particles from a region of high concentration to low concentration and is the reason why things naturally spread out until they're evenly distributed. For example, a water molecule will on average move across the cell membrane if the concentration of water is lower in the cell than outside. This will continue to happen until the concentration is the same on both sides of the membrane. This can be written as a differential equation, which is called Fick's first law. This says that the diffusion flux, or basically how many molecules move past a point, is proportional to the gradient in concentration. If you have a small concentration gradient, that basically means that all of the molecules are fairly well evenly distributed. However, if you have a large concentration gradient, that means that all of the molecules are scrunched up together in one side. So for a small concentration gradient, J is small, but for a large concentration gradient, J is large. The diffusion flux will be zero when all of the molecules are evenly spread out. Now we come on to fluid mechanics. In biology, many processes involve substances being transported in a fluid, for example, in blood circulation and gas exchange. To know how fluids flow in certain geometries and under certain conditions, fluid mechanics is used. Fluid mechanics is a highly advanced topic which requires a lot of knowledge of mathematics, so in this video we'll only consider the basic ideas. So let's consider like a parcel of fluid moving through a current. The parcel is going to have two types of force acting on it as it moves through. It's going to have inertial forces, which arise from differences in the pressure, but also viscous forces, which actually distort the volume of the cube. This can be written mathematically as the famous Navier-Stokes equation. The equation itself is really complicated, but it's basically an F equals MA type of equation, with the forces on the right-hand side and the mass times acceleration on the left-hand side. The equation is so complicated that to this day nobody has yet solved it, and there is actually a Nobel Prize that will be awarded to the first person that does. We can have a look at what each term in the equation actually means. 
This term represents the inertial forces arising from pressure gradients in the fluid, whereas this term here represents the viscous forces. This last term represents the forces due to gravity. Viscosity is basically a measure of how runny a liquid is. So for example, oil has a larger viscosity than water, but treacle has a larger viscosity still. So what would happen if a viscous fluid passed through a pipe as a result of a pressure gradient? Well, by solving the Navier-Stokes equation, we can obtain a relationship for the velocity of the fluid as a function of the radial distance from the center of the pipe. This is known as Poisier flow, and it predicts that the fluid in the middle of the pipe travels much faster than at the edges. This makes sense, as at the edges, the forces arising from viscosity are much greater due to the adhesion between the fluid and the wall through which it's traveling through. This equation can be integrated across the entire cross-sectional area of the pipe to get the volumetric flow rate, which is basically just how much liquid is passing the point per second. Since it's proportional to r to the 4, a small increase in radius will allow a much larger amount of fluid to pass through. We can apply this principle to the circulatory system. While arteries, veins and capillaries are typically thin, this is compensated for by the sheer number of vessels. And now onto our final topic of biological electrodynamics. Normally, we wouldn't really think of biological life as being electronic. However, every organism is teeming with electrical activity. Nerve cells carry electrical signals from receptors to the central nervous system, which is why we can feel things such as temperature. So how are we actually able to feel things? Well, looking on a cellular level, we can see that cells are not in chemical or electronic equilibrium with their environment. Because ions are charged, the difference in ion concentration from both sides of the cell membrane creates a potential difference. This is similar to what goes on in a battery, where the difference in concentration between the positive and negative terminals creates a potential difference. The electrochemical potential across the cell membrane is given by the Nernst equation, where V is the potential difference, T is the temperature, Z is the ion charge, E is the fundamental charge of an electron, and C, out and in, are the concentrations in and out the membrane. The equation basically says that lots of ions need to be pumped across the membrane in order to generate a sufficiently high potential, as it's a logarithmic increase. Ions can pass through the cell membrane through channel proteins, which open and close periodically to allow ions in and out, which alters the concentration. From the Nernst equation, this change in concentration creates a pulsating electrical signal. This characteristic signal is common to many human organs, including the heart and the brain. Hence, by monitoring the electrical activity, we can monitor whether the hospital patient is healthy or not. This is the basis of many important diagnostic techniques. So those were just a few concepts in the vast world of biophysics, which is a rapidly expanding area at the forefront of many cutting edge technologies. If you want to know more about biophysics, check out some of the resources in the description below, with links to some interactive resources to get you stuck in. A huge thanks for watching this video and be sure to check out more videos that we've done.